for death. We're going to be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 20. Now, last week we were in, you might remember what book we were in? Hebrews. Somebody's paying attention. All right, we're in Deuteronomy. Now, what's this, what, what are we studying this year? We'll be there next year, next week, I promise you. So, uh, but anyway, I want to talk tonight about how, um, how, how life is full of choices. And often those choices have life or death consequences. Would you agree with that? On the morning of September the 10th, 2001, Steve Scheidner, who was a Baptist pastor and a commander in the Naval Reserves, and he also flew part-time for American Airlines, he sat down at his computer and he checked to see if there were any available flights for him for the next day. And sure enough, there was one trip that was available on September the 11th. It was American Airlines flight number 11 departing out of Boston's Logan Airport headed towards Los Angeles. And so Scheidner looked at the flight and he could see that there was no pilot signed up for it yet. And so he put his name down for flight number 11. And then he told his wife that he'd be flying the next day and he packed his bags and he got ready for the trip. Now with American Airlines, once you sign up for a flight, there, there follows a 30 minute window during which a more senior pilot can come along and bump a pilot of lesser rank from that flight. And at the end of that 30 minute window, if the pilot has not been bumped, then he'll get a call from American Airlines confirming that he's got that flight for the next day. Well, Shop never got a phone call back from American Airlines. So he went to bed that night assuming that he'd gotten bumped. See, unbeknownst to him, and shortly after he signed up for flight 11, Tom McGinnis, who was a more senior pilot, bumped him. Here's how it happened. At about three o'clock in the afternoon of September the 10th, McGinnis logged onto his computer and saw that flight number 11 was open. Scheidman's name was only penciled in. And since McGinnis was still on, in that 30 minute window, he called American Airlines and asked if he could take that flight. And they said, yes, but you have to let us know in the next 20 minutes. And so he said, I'll take the flight. As a result, McGinnis was the co-pilot of flight of 11 when it took off from Boston, Boston's Logan Airport the following morning. And it was the first jet to crash into the World Trade Center. Tom McGinnis became a victim of the 911 attacks while Scheibner's life was spared, all because of the choices they made. You see, choices can have life or death consequences. Interestingly, Tom McGinnis was a born again, was a born again Christian. In fact, his wife, Cheryl McGinnis, in her book, Beauty Beyond the Ashes, recalls one of the last things that Tom told her. He said, Cheryl, if anything ever happens to me, you have to trust God. God will get you through it. Just surround yourself with loving people, people who know Christ, people who are willing to surround you in Christ-like love. Now tonight, we're going to look at Deuteronomy chapter 11, excuse me, chapter 30. So take your Bibles and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy. And turn to chapter 30, and we're going to look at verses 11 through 20. Now, in this passage of Scripture, the Israelites are about to enter the Promised Land, the land that God had promised to give to Abraham's descendants. And so here they are, poised in the Promised Land, and Moses stands before them with his last words of instruction. Because remember, Moses is not going to be able to enter the Promised Land with them, if you're not familiar with that. God would not allow him because there was a point where Moses didn't trust God and so God is in essence punishing him. In fact, I was telling our leaders, tonight, I just have a question with that. You know, Moses was to me like perfect. So I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven why he kept Moses out of the promised land. But actually he brought him to the promised land. Y'all know where that is? Heaven. All right, so look, look at verse 11. Begin with me. Here's what, Pos here's what Moses said to them. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It's not up in heaven so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so you may obey it. See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction, for I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live in increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're entering to possess. 
But if your heart turns away and you're not obedient, and if you're drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you're crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to His voice, and hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life, and He will give you many years in the land He swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now if you, tonight, if you've got a listening guide, I want you to follow along with me. I want to give you two things. I want to first give you a command, and then I want to give you a choice. And here's the command. And listen, it doesn't come from me. Who does it come from? God. So look at verse 16 again. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live an increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you're entering to possess. You see, when God created Adam and Eve, He placed them in, a, in the Garden of Eden, and He placed them there to, in your outline, to worship and obey Him. His desire from the very beginning was for man to have a relationship with Him that was based on love and that was evidenced by obedience. And his plan, again in your outline, was to bless mankind with every kind of blessing imaginable. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Jeremiah chapter 29, 11. Jeremiah writes, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, this was God's desire from the very beginning, was to create a perfect world, a perfect environment for man to live in, and then to place mankind in this garden where he could actually bless mankind, where, the, where the, we would grow up with this great hope and with this great future. But as we're going to see in Genesis, those plans have been, and I want you to catch this word, those plans have been not canceled but delayed. God is still going to get his way. God one day is going to bless his children with a perfect environment. But you want to make sure that you're one of his children. In the meantime, his plan has been delayed because of man's fall due to sin. As we will learn in Genesis chapter 2, God placed all kinds of trees in the garden, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. But in the middle of the garden, and we will see this in Genesis chapter 3, God placed a tree that was off limits. What was the name of that tree? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he told man, he said, you may eat from any tree in the garden. There were thousands of trees he could have eaten from, but this one tree right here, you're not to eat from this tree. For on the day that you eat from this tree, you will certainly do what? Die. So let me ask you a question. What was God giving to Adam? A choice. He was basically giving Adam an opportunity for Adam to show God that he loved him through his obedience. Remember, choices often have life and death consequences. And this choice that lay before Adam certainly did. As you all probably know, in your outline, Adam gave into temptation by eating from a tree, thus disobeying God. And as a result of his sin, his disobedience, he missed out on what God had planned for him. He missed out on God's bl blessings that God wanted to give him. In fact, God basically kicked him out of the garden and banished him from the garden. And so, for the time being, Adam did not have a hope of a bright future. Now, the book of Exodus, which we're not going to get to this year, tells the incredible story of how God rescued His people from bondage. Remember, I, I talked about that last week. Now He led them to the Promised Land. The Promised Land was, again, another chance for God to bless mankind. He was going to give the Israelites this land that the Bible says was flowing with milk and honey. It was a place where God was going to bless them. But once again, man chose to disobey God, to rebel against Him. And the Israelites, they sinned essentially by not trusting God. And they, they decided they wanted to get rid of their leader, Moses. In other, uh, in other words, because they were rejecting Moses, they were really rejecting God. If you remember, they sent 12 uh, spies in to check out the land, the size of the, the strength of the enemy. 12 men. Well, those, and those men checked out the enemy for how many days? 40. And when they came back, uh, only 10 of them... Well, ten of them said, we, we don't have a chance. They said, the land is full of giants. Only two men, Joshua and Caleb, said that we can take the land. We can take the enemy. And so, so what God did, he banished them to wander in the desert for 40 years. One year for every day that they spied out the land. 
And every man that was over the age of 20 died in the desert with the exception of two men, Joshua and Caleb. And so you can see how the, the, the choices that the Israelites made to not trust God, to not obey Him, led to their death in the desert. And so I want you to see, men, that God gave Adam a choice. And I want you to also see that God gave the Israelites a choice. And all through the Old Testament, God is giving mankind choices. In fact, 2,000 years ago, God gave us a choice when He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. And the choice before us is this. Do you believe God? And the way that you determine whether or not you believe God is what you do with Jesus. Do you believe Jesus? And do you love God? How do you show that you love God? You show Him you love Him by loving His Son. And then the way you, you love the, Jesus is by obeying Him. In fact, in John 14, 21, Jesus said, Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. You see, ultimately, in your outline, it is our obedience to God that shows us whether or not we really love him. And it's our obedience, man, that invites the blessings of God in our lives. Look back at verse 16 again. Moses said, For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live in increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land. And so how do we show our love to God? By what? By obeying Him. Now let me ask you a question. Do you all have a problem with this? In other words, do you, do you struggle with obedience? Do you know who struggles with obedience? Big time. Me. Why is it that we have such a hard time obeying God? In fact, I, I would say that we can't even keep ten commandments, let alone all the other laws in the Bible. For a man to try to keep just the ten commandments, I want you to understand this. It's impossible without God's help. To obey God, it takes, super, it takes a supernatural help. And so the way that you can, this is what I want, the main point I want to make tonight. If you, want to, if you want to live your life to obey God so that, so that He will bless your life, and I want you to understand when I'm talking about God's blessings, I'm not talking about material blessings, and I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about physical blessings. I'm talking about spiritual blessings because they're the real lasting blessings, and that would be God's peace and His joy and contentment. And so, man, if you want to experience God's blessings in your life, which I do, then we've got to figure out how to obey God. And it begins by first... Placing your trust in Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said He's the only way. He is the only way. There is no other way. And so in your outline, each of us must choose, here's one of those choices, to receive Jesus into our heart by faith, into our lives, so that we, we ask Him to be our Lord and our Savior. And I want you to understand this. It's only then that you actually become a child of God, that you become God's Son. Would you like to know that you're God's son? You say, who's your father? God is my father. And guys, I can say that tonight. God is my father. I, Russ Andrews, I'm God's son. And I know a lot of you are God's sons. But listen, if you're not in Christ, then you're not God's son. And so what you should ask me then was, Russ, if you're not sure if you're one of God's children, you, say, you should say, Russ, how can I become one of God's children? Well, here's how. John 1, 12 says, Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become what? Children of God. So let me ask you something. Are we all, are we born, are we all born God's children? That, based on that verse right there. Well, how can you prove that from that verse? What's the one word that is the key? Huh? Become. If you become something, that means you weren't it before. And so if you ever are in church and they say, let's all God's children stand up and recite the Apostles' Creed, really the only people who should stand up are those who are God's children. Because if you say the Apostles' Creed and you're not really a child of God, then it really has no meaning. All you're doing is you're going through an intellectual exercise and you're reciting something that you know, the minister's leading you in. And so I want you men to all know that when you go to church on Sunday and the minister says that, that you actually can stand up and in your heart you know I'm a child of God. And when I say the Apostles' Creed, it has real meaning. And you can actually, according to Romans 8, 15, and 16, you can actually say, Abba, which means what? Daddy. And when you say the Lord's Prayer, you can actually say, My Father, who art in heaven. So would you like to know 
how you become a child of God and how you can know that you have not, you, do you know what identifies you as a child of God? Who, who inside of you? The Holy Spirit. So I'm going to show you right now the two most important verses in the Bible. It's like a recipe. It's almost like a cooking recipe, except it's not a cooking recipe. It's a recipe that gives you two or three steps as to how you can know that you're a child of God. It's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Paul writes, and by the way, in the book of Ephesians, Paul uses this phrase, in him or in Christ, 30 times. He's trying to make a point. You must be what? In him. And guys, I'm not trying to scare you, but listen, if you're not in Christ, then that means you're not going to heaven. So I want to make sure that you're in Christ. And here's how you can make sure. And you also were included in Christ. When? When you heard the word of truth. What's the word of truth? It's the gospel of your salvation. What must I do? You must believe it. Having believed, you are what? Marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So the moment that you hear the gospel and you actually believe it, then God takes His signet ring and He stamps you with a seal, which is the Holy Spirit, and it marks you as one of His children. And so when Jesus returns one day, He's going to be looking for those who have the seal of God on them. It's the Holy Spirit. Do you have the seal of God on your heart? If not, all you have to do is hear the Word and believe it and then place your trust in God's Word and ultimately in Jesus and then you become one of God's children. And then you know what? Death is just a little shadow that you pass through. It's the door that opens the pathway to heaven. So I want you to understand what happens when you receive Jesus into your heart. What happens is the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence within you. And then He begins to transform you from the inside out so that you can live this Christian life which is so difficult. Take your Bibles and turn to Romans with you, okay? Romans chapter 1. Now, actually, we'll end up in Romans 8, but I want to walk you through. I'm going to walk you through We're the first eight chapters of Romans in 30 seconds. Are you ready? I'm serious. All right, Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. We, we learn from that that, that uh, salvation comes to everyone who does what? Are y'all with me? Believes. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is real. A righteousness that is by what? Faith. And then if you look at the rest of Romans 1, Paul gives this downward spiral of sin that we're on. We're just getting worse and worse, and the world's getting worse and worse. And have y'all noticed that? It's just getting worse. Now, I could just go watch television. I mean, back in my day, we watched I Love Lucy and Sky King and The Lone Ranger and I Love Lucy and Dick Van Dyke. And, I mean, it was just great. Black and white, three channels. I mean, I can't figure out what to watch. I got 500 channels. I'm going, Chris, what are you watching? I'm watching about 15 channels right now. That has nothing to do with the study. All right, so um, Romans chapter 3. If you look at Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, it says there's no one righteous, not even one. There's no one who understands God, no one who seeks God. We've all turned away. We've together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. And then Romans 3, 23. Well, it says Romans 3, 23. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. So what Paul is doing, he's laying us long than 30 seconds, right? Longer than 30 seconds. He's laying out the foundation that we need to be saved by Jesus. And he's doing this by showing us that we've all sinned. And then when you get over to Romans chapter 7, this is where, when I look at my life, I go, this is so me. Look at Romans 7, you know, 14 and 5. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer myself who do it. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good. Y'all have the desire, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. And so Paul is just in this dilemma. And he's a believer. There's this war going on in his soul between the natural man, the flesh, and the spiritual man. The devil knows this war, and he said, the only way you can have this war is if the Spirit is in you. If, if, you don't, if the Spirit's not in you, you're really not at war. You're just doing whatever you want to do. You're living according to your sinful nature. But if you have the Spirit in you, all of a sudden you're at a war. It's taking place in your mind and your heart. And so the Spirit 
is fighting against your flesh to conform it into the pattern of Jesus so that you live a more godly life. And that brings us to Romans chapter 8. And so, Paul has laid out for us here in Romans what it means to be a Christian. You must come by faith. In the moment that you place your trust in Jesus, He wipes the slate clean. He forgives you for all of your sins. And then look at Romans 8 verse 1. Therefore, the therefore is going back to Romans chapters 1 through 7. There's no, now no what? No condemnation for those who are what? In Christ Jesus. And so see, the moment that you place your trust in Him, He wipes the slate clean. And I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've had, I mean, I care. But as far as your salvation, it doesn't matter. I don't care if you've had a bunch of abortions, paid for them. I don't care if you've been addicted to pornography. I don't care if you've had, you know, 10 DWIs. I don't care if you've used the Lord's name in vain. I don't care what it is. If you, if you come to the Lord and ask Him to forgive you, Think of a chalkboard with all your sins are there. He takes an eraser and he erases all, this, all your sins away. And he declares you righteous. And he says, therefore, there's now no condemnation. If y'all knew some of my sins, you'd say, what are you doing up there teaching this class? And I'd say, well, I, by the grace of God, he uses a sinner like me to, to talk to a bunch of sinners like you. Therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of, of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. You see, Jesus came and died to be a, be a sin offering for us. And so God condemned sin in sinful man who actually was Jesus because He took our sins upon Him. He became the sinful man that God condemned in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot what? Please God. You, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not what? Okay, now I didn't write that. So I just want you to see that I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm trying to be truthful. Because it's the truth that will set you free. If you're not... If the Spirit is not in you, then I don't care how many times you've been to church. I don't care how many times you've been baptized. I don't care how many good deeds you've done. If the Spirit is not in you, then you do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead because of sin, yet your spirit is alive because of righteousness. Do you know why God put that tree in the garden? He knew that Adam had sinned. Do you know why God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses? He did it knowing that we could not keep them. Do you, so, do, so the question is, well, God, then why did you put the tree in there and why did you give us the Ten Commandments? Do you know why? It was to lead us to himself. Here's how it works. This is what happened to Martin Luther. The, the Martin Luther, um, who set off the Protestant Reformation, he began to, he read the Bible and he saw what he should be doing and he got frustrated because he couldn't do it. He couldn't live this righteous life. And so when he read Romans, he realized, well, right, he, he realized that righteousness doesn't come from us. It comes from God. He gives it to you. And so the, but the reason Martin Luther pursued Jesus was because of the law. Because he looked at the law and he said, I can't keep it. And so he, he came to realize he needed what? A Savior. And so the law, God gave us the law to show us our need that we can't keep it. Anybody here can keep the Ten Commandments? Anybody in here lusted at a woman today? Um, God says do not covet. You're coveting another woman. We're not to commit adultery. You're, you're committing, Jesus said when you've lusted after a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. Anybody ever committed murder? Do you hate anybody? Jesus said if you've hated, then you've committed murder. See, hate is the root of murder. Galatians 3.24 says that the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. 
Now I want you to notice from Romans chapter 8 that we learned that the battleground is where? In the mind. I had a young um, boy come to me this week. He was 15. He wanted to make sure that he was saved. And he said, I'm struggling with sin. I said, okay, what are you really struggling with? What do you think you're struggling with? Say it again. Pornography. And you know what I told him? I said, I understand. I've been there. And I said, um, I said, I can tell you exactly what you're going through. You, you, you give in to that temptation. You look at things you, you shouldn't be looking at. And, and I, I, he wanted to make sure he was saved. I knew he was saved because of the overwhelming guilt he was experiencing. Why was he experiencing this guilt? Because all the Holy Spirit's in him, convicting him. I explained to him that when he's looking at those images, he's, he's, he's making the Holy Spirit look at it with him. He's taking Jesus with him to his iPad, which is where he told me he was sinning. And he was basically forcing Jesus to look at that stuff with him. And that's what we do when we sin. I said, it probably takes you two or three days to get over the guilt. He said, that's right. I said, I know. I've been there. You see, the battle, I said, the battle is in your, is in the, in your mind. We've got to pull up safeguards. The Bible says to guard your mind and your heart, for from it is the wellspring of life. As a child of God, in your outline, you must learn to surrender your mind totally to the Spirit. I'm still working on this. I became a Christian when I, when I was 10. I'm 59. <laughs> I've been struggling through this Christian life for 49 years. And I'm convinced I'm going to struggle to the day I die. But listen, God is helping me to be a better Christian. And He will do the same thing for you. But, it, but you have to surrender your, your heart and your mind to the Spirit the moment you get up in the morning. You have to put on the full armor of God. And listen, as you do this, here's what will happen. You will be, you'll begin to experience life and peace and the guilt, guys, will go away. Has anybody here struggled with guilt recently? Anybody had any guilt? The guys aren't raising their hands are afraid to raise their hands. Listen, do y'all know what everybody in the world wants? You know, fancy, expensive toys, build bigger houses. Everybody's trying to find Peace and contentment. Have you ever watched the Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous on TV? That program, most of them, their lives are falling apart and they're miserable. When in fact, here's the deal, guys. Life and peace are within your reach. Look at verse 11 through 14 again. Now what I'm commanding you today is not too difficult for you or beyond your reach. It is not up in heaven, I'm back at Deuteronomy chapter 30. It is not up in heaven, so that you have to ask, who will ascend into heaven to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? Nor is it beyond the sea, so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea to get it and proclaim it to us so we may obey it? No, the word is very near you, it is in your mouth and in your heart, so you may obey it. I want you to understand, men, that God is near to you. Psalm 145.18 says, The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. Psalm 34.18 states, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. See, so that, that boy came to me. He was crushed in his spirit. And I asked him, I said, when, when he got through confessing that to me, I said, how do you feel right now? He said, I feel good. See, when you confess it, you... And you're expressing to God that you have a broken spirit over your sin. That's what God wants to see. He just wants to see that, we're, that we are broken over our sin and confess it. And boy, He just, He loves, He draws near to a heart that's broken and contrite. Isaiah 55, 6 says, Seek the Lord while He may be found, call on Him while He is near. And so, guys, you know, if you want to find God, you don't have to go up to heaven. You don't have to cross the Atlantic Ocean. He's right here in this room with us. All you have to do is call out to Him. And you come to know God, men, through the study of His Word. That's why this is a Bible study. It's something supernatural that takes place when you pick up the Bible and begin to study it. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Faith is born 
as you pick up this Bible and begin to read it because God's voice, He speaks to you through His Word. That's why this book is banned in so many countries. The governments there in those countries, they don't understand it. They just know it's changing their people and they want to control the people so they get rid of the book. This is God's Word. you got to end here. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you what? Rest. And so, men, I'm closing tonight. I want to lay before you a choice. And the choice is this. And, and I'm dead serious. It's, it's, it's between life and death. You, you, you make a choice. Look at verses 19 and 20. This day... I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you may, so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to His voice and hold fast to Him. For the Lord is your life and He will give you many years in the land. Literally, He will give you eternity. So you have to decide if you want to choose life. In John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have life to the full. He wants us to have an abundant life. That was God's plan in the garden, to give man an abundant life. But we blew it. But you know, God still wants to give us an abundant life. And it's going to be real abundant when we get to heaven. But because of that. See, here's the problem. When we were born, in your outline, we were born with a dead spirit. And that, that dead spirit needs to be given life. John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, I'll tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's what? Born again. And so listen, when you place your trust in Jesus, as I've been saying, it's like a, it's like a dead lawn, it's like a lawnmower, not a dead one, but a lawnmower that you've had in your basement, which is basically dead. It's got no spark plugs. It's got no gasoline in it. It will not start. But as soon as you put new spark plugs in it and you connect everything back up and you put some good fuel in it, you pull the cord and it hums like it's brand new. And that's a picture of what happens to us when we place our trust in Jesus. Your dead spirit is giving, is giving new birth. It's, all of a sudden, the points and the spark plugs are all firing. And you begin to live this Christian life. And some incredible things happen when you're born again. You're given the gift of eternal life. Secondly, and I wish I had time to talk about that, but I mean, eternal life, I want you to understand, it's a present tense. I mean, you're given eternal life in the here and now. So when you're born again, you have eternal life. In essence, you can't die. You're going to die physically, but you're not going to die spiritually. And when you pass through death's door, you're going to be given a new resurrection body that's, that's, that's built to last forever. And you're going to live in a place that the Bible calls paradise. It's going to be the new garden of Eden. This is what the Bible says. And th this is what my hope is in. Is what the Bible says. But listen. Eternal life is now and it's coming. But I also want you to understand that when you're born again, He gives you a new life in your outline in the here and now. You become a new creation. I mean, I've seen this happen. This is our eighth year. I've watched some of you men come to Christ and now you're living this new life. And you, you have peace and joy and contentment that the world knows nothing about. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 states, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? Creation. The old has gone. The new has come. We're out of time. Let me just close with this. Choice is yours. God has put the ball in your court, so to speak. You have to decide whether you want life or death. And so my advice would be to choose life so that you and your children may live in the land that God is preparing for us. We're going to see next week that God created the world. I personally think it's seven days. Seven days. I don't really care. I want to, he created the world. I think he did it in seven days. But Jesus has been preparing heaven for us the last 2,000 years. Can you imagine what that's going to look like? Do you want to be there? Choose life. Let's pray. Dearly Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray to God that, that I made it clear to them.
And I pray to God that if there's a man here tonight who wants to choose life, if he'll actually come up and talk to me after this lecture. And we can pray together and he can receive you in his heart by faith. Lord, be with these men as they spend time in your word this week. As we look at Genesis chapter 1 and see the incredible way that you created this beautiful world for us to live in. And I look forward to the day when you return to this earth and you restore it and make it like brand new. It's in your name that I pray. Amen. See you guys next week.